Welcome to Low Tech Tuesdays by Low Tech and Wild, the podcast for those who live their life unplugged and for those who want to. Low Tech and Wild is a podcast brought to you by Valdez Adventure Alliance in Valdez, Alaska. We have guests that we learn from from all around the world, and we invite anyone who is interested to come and visit the beauty of Valdez, Alaska. Hey, Carlos, welcome right. to the Low Tech and Wild podcast. Thank you. So thank you very much. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. I really appreciate it. I look forward to getting to know you and your and learning about your extensive mountaineering uh, background. It is really, really impressive. And wow, you know, some of the accomplishments, first ascents. And to learn that you grew up in a suburb of New York City, one of the biggest metropolitan areas in the whole United States, and then to live your life basically in remote areas of the world. So I appreciate your taking the time. I want to tell me all about it. Well, no, it's true. I grew up, uh, I was born in Manhattan and uh, my parents lived in a suburb of New York City, about 20 miles from from downtown. And uh, my father was uh, an insurance manager and got the train into New York every day, five days a week, came home in the, you know, seven o'clock in the evening, led a, a, a commuter lifestyle there. And, and uh, we grew up in a town that was uh, relatively uh, relatively far from uh, what you might call a, a, an urban sprawl. We, we were lucky to have a, a little lake near the house and, uh, you know, a place you could go down and, and uh, look for frogs and, and uh, get your feet muddy and, you know, find uh, nature nearby. Uh, but it, it was definitely... Uh, neighborhoods of the type you would imagine in a suburb um groups of different uh, ethnic backgrounds all uh basically uh creating small neighborhoods within a, a community uh, then education was uh was diversified you might say you know the little groups and communities in the high school and the in the junior high school was um you know, a combinations of Jewish, Italian, um, Irish, you know, it was fascinating. Wonderful. That's great. No, it's really important to, to have that mix. What about yourself? Do you, uh, did your family uh, value so, uh, the, I guess, the cultural ethnicity in your, in your family? Well, my father was Jewish. My mother was Catholic. And uh, okay. so clearly there was no strong um, insistence by mm -hmm. either parent to, uh, you know, dominate any kind of, of religious training. There was, um, you know, we were, we uh, considered ourselves uh, relatively open to all uh, ways of thinking about, about uh, spirituality. And, and it, I don't remember ever being uh, uh, railroaded towards one or another. And, uh, that was quite a, an advantage. Although in our, in our growing up lives, we, we tended to, uh, have friends from all, from all denominations. So, you know, it was a, it was a nice introduction. I, I, f I felt lucky, uh, actually, because, um, you know, I, I felt comfortable around, a lot of different kinds of folks and and you know growing up in new york has the advantage of um, giving you that sense that when you go into a large city you're relaxed and i always appreciated that for me learning how to be relaxed in the mountains was what i had to learn and and uh, as a kid being relaxed in a city you know was something uh that we got from birth uh, you know we were always going into the city to do something and whether it was a museum or an appointment or seeing family we had family in the city uh, you know we got used to the subways and the 
the uh, congested highways and so forth. So later, for example, when I studied a year in uh, high school in Barcelona, Spain, uh, as part of a, a language program, the, the program was relatively um, unforeign to me in terms of the city life. And, and I chalked that up to having uh, lived in a large city. And so um, it, it, it gave us advantages. I think I'm talking about us being myself and two older brothers. Mm -hmm. I'm the youngest of three. But then again, my parents were not active in the mountains at all, other than for downhill skiing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a little downhill skiing as I was growing up in uh, areas near um, near New York. Uh, and my mom came from a, a cattle ranch. Uh, her, her father and her father's father were immigrants who moved to New Mexico. So from where? They came from southern France oh. and they were they were uh, sheep farmers. Uh, you know, they, they, they raised sheep. Uh, for a living, as did a lot of uh, people from the Pyrenees, and um, government was handing out, you know, land trying to populate that area, and uh, they would, they came over, took a uh, a bit of land from the government, and agreed to live there, and and uh, began raising sheep. So, their what I their connection to nature. Yeah. was completely different from what I was growing up around in New York City. Uh, although, you know, we had woods near the house and we had, uh, a, you know, reservoir close yeah. by. Mm -hmm. My mother had grown up on a cattle ranch where, where we were, she was, I don't know, 15 or 20 miles from the nearest town. And, and that meant uh, dirt roads. So, Often you were cut off from the towns uh, during uh, thunderstorms and mud season. Um, it gave her a sense of nature and the power of nature, which she kind of, I would say, she molded it or folded it into her life back east, um, but in a way that that transferred a little bit of that to us, and and we spent time on her parents' home uh, in New Mexico growing up. Every summer, we would go out for a couple of months. So we would see a completely different life uh, lived on a, on a ranch uh, where, where there were sheep at that time and also cattle uh, that we knew of in, in a suburb of New York City. And, and that was really my only introduction to, to the yeah. mountains, if you could call it that. Yeah, in, ranches you know, are typically, years. ranches are more in, uh, in the flatter areas of remote areas where there are mountains. So did it, but, but is that where, and you said New Mexico, is that correct? Uh, yeah, Northeast New Mexico, um, okay. a little so town called so Wagon Mound. So there were there are mountains around there. Is that where you started um, hiking and climbing and getting into well, some snow? It it you know it's funny you say that mm -hmm. because no not climbing at all mm -hmm. but uh, for for example there were deep canyons in deep, especially for a youngster they felt very deep. Um, the Moore River was near the cattle ranch. And, you know, when you think about, we, we didn't think of it as hiking. Um, we, would, we would walk down into those canyons, uh, generally exploring, and my mother was an anthropologist by education. Oh, so nice. we would, we'd be looking for arrowheads. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we would, we would uh, ride our, you know, by horseback. Uh, through these areas, and then we would hike down into the canyons uh, because there was that's where the, the caves were along the the riverbanks where uh, we would find you know pot sherds and and lots of flint and and occasionally an arrowhead 
And um, I guess that was hiking, mm -hmm. but we didn't think of it as hiking. I, I just remember walking up out of those canyons and being really out of breath, you know, trying to keep up with the adults. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> would set a pace that I could barely keep up with. Wow. And, you know, we would be walking in uneven terrain and, you know, and, and so you, you didn't really, you know, I don't think I even understood the word hiking, but uh, as a little kid, uh, that was a very different thing from a field sport that we might've played in, um, you know, in our schools back in, in Harrison, New York. Gotcha. And do you think that watching your father living a commuting life um, having an office life also, do you think that that was part of the reason why you chose to go more into the wild? I've never really thought about that. Um, it could indeed have influenced me in a way that was, you know, underneath a lot of layers. Uh, what I did see was that he was stressed mm. and I noticed that especially when, you know, after I was about 10 years old, unfortunately, the stress uh, caused my father to, to have a heart attack and die when I was 10. And so mm. I had to internalize that. Uh, and, 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 and try to find some kind of, um, of path. But, you know, as a kid, you, you only know what you know. Right. So you don't know if that's so different from anybody else's reality. Sure. And, and so I don't think of it as much of as a hardship as I did later trying to look back when I was 17 or 18. Mm -hmm. I, then I was trying to understand, uh, how different was that from, from my other friends? Perhaps those things do make a difference uh, when, when you're really trying to, you know, survive as a youngster in, in, a, in a competitive world. Yeah. So I, I think what was really more influential was that I had two older brothers, as I mentioned to you earlier, who were academically very, very proficient. And uh, I was finding myself caught up in their, in their wave, actually. And I didn't like it. It, it. it was an expectation from everyone around me if I would somehow be, uh, you know, another... Uh, you know, another of the three Bueller boys. And, and I, I wasn't motivated to spend as much time as my brothers had on academic uh, pursuits. They were outstanding in school. And um, I was average. And I, I didn't, I had a lot of other outside interests. Mm -hmm. So that kind of pressure was very influential. Um, I wanted to get out from under that. Did you did you study anything in in college or graduate school or anything like that? Yeah, I went on to uh, university in Washington State in yeah. Bellingham, Washington, and I I uh, another great outdoors area. It, it is an outdoor area, and I and I went there because of it. Um, but by that time, I was already climbing. And okay. when I, I moved to Bellingham, I was a junior in uh, university. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was studying environmental education and human ecology. Nice. And uh, it was quite different from the path... Uh, that my brothers had followed. And, and I think I, that was probably not a mistake. I mean, it was one of my brothers um, became an attorney and, and the other became a, a financial um, expert. Mm -hmm. And both were living in California at the time. And uh, 
they became extremely involved in California politics. And politics have been um, dominating, I would say, uh, their non-professional, well, in the case of one brother, his professional life, uh, and in the case of the other, in his entire uh, non-career-based non life uh, was, was politics. So that, that had a big effect on me. Well, tell me about when you did actually first, when did the light bulb go off? When, when, so if you were a junior in college already, by the time you went to Washington state, tell me about when you, when that light bulb went off, when you realized that climbing, mountaineering, I mean, did you even realize that there was a connection? I mean, cause a lot of people start off sport climbing. Of course, when you started, it was trad, right? Only. Right. And so, I mean, did you make the connection like this is a piece of mountaineering? You know, did some, did you have a mentor? Yeah, so it, it was quite different. Um, How old were you? I was you about 15 years old. It was before okay. I went to university in uh, Bellingham. Mm -hmm. The light went off for me in, a, in an interesting way. I, I took a, one of these National Outdoor Leadership School oh, yes, programs. When I was 15. And uh, so I, they were in Wyoming at the time. Mm -hmm. It was uh, a program that opened my eyes to, you know, then I understood what was hiking, right? Yes. For five weeks, moving through the mountains with a backpack on. That, that was a, an activity that I had only mildly practiced in the Boy Scouts. But the following year, uh, I did another Knowles program because I had no idea how to get back to the wilderness where I was living. Mm -hmm. And and that was a, a sea kayaking program on Prince William Sound. Oh, no kidding. In Alaska. And uh, it was the summer of 1971. And I Knowles was opening up the sea kayaking program. And um, I decided to ask my mom if I could participate. And I was 16 and quite young mm -hmm. and uh, spent five, 35 days on, on Prince William Sound in a sea kayak. When I came back from that, it, that had been a very powerful experience, not climbing oriented, but mm -hmm. wilderness oriented. Yes. And um, I, you know, something had happened. I, I understood that there was a whole world out there. Mm -hmm. I saw the characters, you know, who were, who were, you know, during both programs, the, the people that were respected, uh, revered, even, you know, you hear the conversation among the instructors and, and it's like hearing a group of climbers talk about stuff, right? Well, when you're 16 and 15 years old, that all makes an impression on you. And the following year, I graduated from, from my high school. And uh, I joined this little group of, of high school graduates that was led by a fellow who had expertise in mountaineering. And every summer, he and his wife took a group of young students who had just finished high school out to British Columbia. That was his norm. Mm -hmm. And... That particular year, he took his, he decided to, to go out instead of to British Columbia to the Alps of Northern Italy. And uh, he took about a dozen high school students uh, to a small, uh, well, it was not a very small valley uh, in, in the Northern Italy in the Alps there near the Monte Rosa. And we spent six weeks there and we, he was the one who began to really teach me about the link between hiking and the wilderness mm -hmm. and, and actually climbing. And I hadn't really fully appreciated that. Uh, that was the first time I was ever introduced, for example, to crampons. Uh, first time I ever was really understanding uh, what it was like to reach a top, a summit of 
of some mountain and then, you know, have to, to get back down. Of course, we had done that during Knowles, mm -hmm. but, but this was a whole different activity where that was the entire objective. We weren't just moving through the mountains. We were going to a specific mountain to climb it. And um, I was 17 then. And after that summer, and a couple of very, very uh, intense uh, climbs. That, that summer, I, I, I made an ascent of uh, the Matterhorn by the Italian Ridge um, from, you know, the south side. And then I climbed uh, something called the Middle Aggy Ridge on the Eiger, uh, a, a relatively uh, easy scramble, but still technical on the east uh, on the, I think it's the east ridge of the uh, of the Eiger, and when that summer was done, I realized the light had gone on. You know, you asked about the light, yes. and I sat back and I thought, "Wow, there's there's a world there I I really want to explore." Right. And so that fall, um, I was thinking I'm going to join a club. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to really explore this. I want to get more expertise in it. I realized it was a whole world I knew nothing about. And um, I really wanted to go someplace with it. So I moved to Barcelona, Spain. I was um, going to spend uh, my gap year, as they call it, mm -hmm. in Barcelona. I, I'd spent my 11th grade in Barcelona, and I'd learned some Spanish. So when I went back after my graduation, I I lived in uh, with a family that I had met the year before, and and I enrolled at the University of Barcelona, nice. and uh, that year climbing became a dominant part of my life. You know, every weekend I was going out to rock climb at the nearby venues, and and so that was really when the light turned on that summer of um, of going out with that fellow into Northern Italy and, and exploring that. That's fantastic. And with it being in Europe, you have access to so, so many more countries really, and so many more cultures because it is, it's kind of like the United States, you know, except that we all, we all speak the same language here. We all generally have the same traditions. Um, you know, in Europe, you can go to Italy or France or, you know, it's, all yeah. right there right and then barcelona yeah. is uh you know right on the mediterranean you're also exposed to catalan there right yes. the catalonian country or language um absolutely yeah. i lived with a catalan family uh yeah. and so it was um yeah it was very it was very much an eye opener mm -hmm. because you can't understand that was there a cultural mm -hmm. shift when you came back to climb in the States then after that? Because I feel like, you know, I almost feel like Europeans kind of, when they mountaineer, or if they have that in their family, it's kind of in their blood, you know what I mean? Where I think mm -hmm. that Americans are a little bit more pulled away from nature maybe than Europeans are sometimes. You know, the thing is, and what, what I realized in Spain was, mm -hmm. uh, Every family, even in the 70s, every family knew somebody who climbed or was involved in, in that aspect of it. Barcelona was near enough to the Pyrenees mm -hmm. uh, and Spain was small enough. And the news, as you say, you know, the culture yes. uh, would cover it a little bit. Mm -hmm. There were some outing clubs in Barcelona that were quite big. Uh, you know, they, they had many members. They weren't all technical climbers, but there were divisions of the club that climbed and they weren't, uh, it wasn't like the American Alpine Club where, you know, there was a member here in this part of the world and a member there. I mean, back in those days, the American Alpine Club had like 1200 members in the, you know, a country of 300 million people. Right. So I, I began to understand, as you say, a, a cultural acceptance mm -hmm. to climbing there that didn't exist 
or at least a consciousness. Um, it was it was a very big difference. Uh, some of the families that, uh, meaning the parents of the people that I climbed with, mm-hmm. uh, I realized that though they didn't climb and climbers were still considered a, an anomaly, uh, you know, they they had heard of it. They knew what it was uh, in a suburb of New York. Uh, there was very little consciousness of what, you know, people were doing. I think that was different if you grew up in Denver or you grew up, you know, say in Seattle where you had these, you know, mountaineering communities right, near right. Mount Rainier or, or you know, yes. mm-hmm. the Rock Mountains. But where I grew up, um, you know, trying to climb something like Katahdin in winter, mm-hmm. you know, that, that was not even... I didn't even see that on the on the menu. Sure. And, I think it's because there are locals, you know, that do that. And so if you have another thing about Europe versus the United States is I think that the people were they stay put more and mm-hmm. for longer generations, whereas we're moving around and a lot of the times we're moving from city to city. And so the folks that lived in the more remote areas didn't get the same attention. But I bet that the locals around Katahdin were absolutely (laughs) exploring around there. It's just that it didn't, unless you were one of them or knew one of them, you didn't hear about it, you know? Well, that's right. I think you're right. If you grew up, uh, say, in, uh, you know, an area like Tacoma, Mm -hmm. you know, you, you knew what a mountain was because every day you got up, you'd see Mm -hmm. this beautiful mountain you know on the horizon whereas um you know where i grew up there were no big glaciated peaks on the horizon (laughs) which was one of the reasons i moved and went you know to school in bellingham because it was much more you know the north cascades was nearby and and uh even the universities you know folded that reality into their programs and it it was uh quite a nice uh an environment uh, that I appreciated, you know, the professors, students, uh, in their spare time, a lot of them went hiking and yeah. some of them even went climbing. So, you know, that was a, a, uh, once I discovered it, you know, those places became felt much more like home. Gotcha. Yeah. And also it lends to that endless curiosity, you know, it's like pulling a thread you know, and it just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. And there's, you know, there's more stuff down there and it's all good, you know? <laughs> well, most of it's good. Not most all of it, it's but, good. That's but true. most it's, of it's good. <laughs> it's a very, very dangerous sport. It's a very dangerous sport. And I, and I almost worry that, um, you know, I, I'm in a lot of the conversation groups that I am happen to be in online, I'm, I'm always grateful at the number of people that are just getting into it that ask the questions. You know, I want to go from gym to crag. You know, I want to try ice climbing for the first time. How do I approach this in the right way, you know, safely? Because I mean, it's so, if you are like a a quote unquote gym rat and you know, you're feeling the endorphins when you go and you get that thrill, it's completely a different animal when you're doing it in the world, you know? And, uh, and then when you take that next leap and you go into mountaineering and full on, you know, alpinism, and you are dealing with glaciers and you are dealing with crevasses, crossing crevasses or steep pitches, you know, that could crumble on you. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's a different animal, you know? So, um, so when did you make that leap? Cause you have some serious, uh, things I'm looking at your, um, bio right here and you have got some serious climbs on your resume. The, the interesting answer to your question is it was reversed for me. I, I didn't really know about the sport of rock climbing, mm-hmm. um, as a standalone sport uh like i might have had i grown up near a rock climbing area that i was aware of the gunks were were near me but i did not have them in my consciousness and i and i didn't know about the world of of yosemite for example which if i had grown up in you know 
in Sacramento mm -hmm. or, you know, San Francisco, um, the culture around those climbing communities is much more oriented towards rock climbing. Mm -hmm. uh, not that you don't have the Sierra Nevada nearby, but, but it's a dominating force. For me, going to Knowles, mm -hmm. we, weren't, we weren't taught rock climbing as a separate entity. Gotcha. We were taught hiking. Mm -hmm. And so when we went up a mountain, we hiked up a mountain and right. or scrambled up a mountain. Mm -hmm. and, and when I went to Italy with uh, Peter Schreiber, mm -hmm. this, this uh, gentleman who took us there, uh, our introduction was never about rock climbing. When I discovered rock climbing, it was as an add-on to what we were trying to do in the mountains. So I had climbed in quotes, ascended or made a sense of numerous peaks in the Alps. And as they got steeper, uh, we had to use our hands. And as we felt, say, we were taking, you know, we might fall, then we took out the ropes. Right. And, and so it was just an extension of hiking. And by the time we were doing rock climbing pitches on mountains, uh, we weren't thinking about strengthening our forearms or making uh, balancey moves uh, that we were learning. It, it was a form of scrambling and hiking. So it was, I would even say, several years later after I returned to, uh, to New Mexico, which is where I went to university the first couple of years, mm -hmm. that all of a sudden I realized there was, was much easier to go to a little rock climbing crag mm -hmm. uh, near Albuquerque to train for climbing. Right. And, and we would throw a top rope over a cliff or go to a bouldering area and try to do these problems. But in my heart, I was just training for mountains. Uh, I was never interested in, in rock climbing. I didn't go to, uh, you know, a lot of these sort of specialized rock climbing areas. Yeah. But then we would meet somebody who mm -hmm. was clearly a rock climber. And we would be awed. I was awed at their unbelievable technical ability. Yeah. And uh, when I saw that, and I looked up at the mountains that are near Albuquerque, you know, the Sandia peaks have a number of rock faces. And I thought, wow, I need to concentrate on that so that I can become a rock climber ah. who can then transfer those skills to going to a place like the Alps. Right. And, and that was, you know, my entrance into rock climbing I, ice climbing was exactly the same. I, I, I was, I was given a pair of crampons and plodding around on glaciers like, like you would say in the North Cascades. Mm -hmm. uh, but we didn't have front points on those crampons in the beginning. Uh. And, and then when we got crampons with front points, mm -hmm. all of a sudden we could climb gullies and and things that were icy. Uh, that you know didn't have rock in them yeah. and that that raised the you know the bar and then when it got even steeper mm -hmm. I, I wasn't sure what was going on because we, we didn't have a concept that ice axes would stick you know mm -hmm. in that kind of ice right so I came up to the Canadian Rockies and uh I knew that was kind of the I had learned from in while well in New Mexico, you know, where do people go to practice alpinism? Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me that everybody, the real alpinists, went to the Canadian Rockies. So I drove up there and I was blown away because mm -hmm. the waterfall frozen ice revolution was just beginning in the wow. mid-70s. And uh I had no idea about how to stick to frozen ice, water ice. I had been using crampons on alpine ice, you know, things like 
what you would find in a gully in the Alps. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the routes I had done there were more rocky routes, like the Middle Aggie Ridge on, on the Eiger or the Italian Ridge on the Matterhorn. But you would carry crampons so that you could maneuver through the gullies and so forth. And, and mixed climbing back then, of course, was the classic Alpine mixed, where you would be on rock with your crampons on, you know, between the ice, but you'd have to cross some rocky sections. Yeah. So, you know, the mixed climbing thing was, um, was just a question of not taking the time to take crampons off. Yeah. And so you'd learn how to move on, on rock with your crampons on, which was incredibly awkward. Yeah. But when I got to Canada, I realized, oh my gosh, there is a whole revolution here of people climbing these drips that are frozen, these waterfalls, and I need to learn how to do that. And that again, was like discovering rock climbing for me. It wasn't that I was after ice climbing. I was trying to figure out how I could do more in the mountains if I could climb steeper ice with more confidence and more speed. Yes. Do you have any, uh, do you have any favorites that are out there? And actually, just to revisit some of the things that you are talking about, did you guys with your peer group back in the 70s talk about aid climbing versus vertical climbing? Um, I mean, was there even, did people even say the words like bouldering? Um, my understanding also is that the American grading system, which of course is all very subjective, so a 5.10 or 5. Point whatever. The mm -hmm. five indicates that you are, and you mentioned this, you said there's becomes a point where you have to use your hands, right? Mm -hmm. And so that five indicates that it's three points of contact on a rock. So if it's a five point something, so if you're looking at a grading system for something, and it's different in everywhere all around the world. Um, and like I said, it's all very subjective, but I mean, is this, is this something that you guys even talked about? You know, like, like, hey, we're going to go rock climbing. Hey, we're going to go aid climbing. Hey, we're going to go, you know, climb this mountain. It's going to be mixed terrain and it gets to be really steep, probably a 514 at some point, you know, or there's a, there's water ice three, you know, waterfall on this thing, you know. Yes, absolutely. There, the grading uh, was fully fully uh, integrated into everything we did. Mm -hmm. So remember that, um, you know, of course, 514 climbing had not been invented yet. Right. But, but that kind what, of makes the 510 shoe kind of uh, an interesting mark in time, actually, right? Yeah, and I right. think, yeah, and because 510 at one point, that was like the the top, you know, 510 now is primarily a mountain bike shoe. Like yes. all the mountain bikers that I know, they're like, oh, have you heard of these 510 mountain bike? They have no idea that that's a rock climbing grade, right. you know? <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, so, you know, but just uh, accepting that the grades were more, um, you know, what was possible was less, uh, you know, less of a, a, a grade still. Mm -hmm everything was related to grade uh, in terms of, of mountains and in terms of uh, crags, mm -hmm. ice climbs. By the mid seventies, by 1975 and 1976, um, you know, I mean, that was when I was beginning in 74, I went, I spent the summer of 1974 in Chamonix uh, climbing in the Alps there. Everything was graded. So we understood that grades, what grades were. And there was a, a rock grade, you know, um, and so forth. I, I had gone to, uh, to, North, uh, to North Wales and I wanted, you know, to get introduced to rock climbing. And when I went there, it was for a purpose, right? I, I, I knew that that, that place was a, a place of rock climbing. And uh, everything, of course, was graded without even thinking about 
mountains. People there were focused on rock climbing without making any connection. Lots and lots of them never went out to the Alps. It was a rock climbing area like, like you would find in the gunks. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yes, to answer your question, everything was graded. Uh, even in Canada, by the time I, I was introduced to uh, Canadian ice, in my mind, it was ex very developed. Um, everything was climbed and I was late on the scene mm. and there were climbers everywhere. Now that gives you a perspective. That was mid seventies. Um, you know, it was like going to Boulder, Colorado and where you had just, again, that sort of, uh, concentration of people that were very focused on rock climbing and had become exceptionally uh, gifted rock climbers. Those were, were, let's call them icons of, of, a, of an area uh, that, you know, I was just overwhelmed with. I, I was um, in awe of how people had become specialized and those names of those people, just like you would find a similar kind of um, culture in, around Mount Rainier mm -hmm. in the North Cascades, where the legends of those areas were, you know, you would hear them whispered in kind of conversations and in, in, in uh, you know, clubs and get togethers of climbers. Uh, in places like North Wales, th there was that same culture. But I didn't discover that in the very first years. As I said, I was more of a a mountaineer. Yes. And so I realized rock climbing was a part of it. I realized ice climbing was a part of it. And I realized predicting weather was a part of it. I realized that, uh, you know, knowing how to dress was a part of it. Yes. I knew yes. that there was a lot of different aspects to being successful on a climb that had nothing to do with how you moved over the terrain of rock and ice and snow. And so they were like add-ons, uh, almost like you would say to yourself, well, to really succeed in climbing in Nepal, you could do well by learning to speak Nepali. Now, mm -hmm. Nepali doesn't have anything to do with climbing, but right. it certainly helps you to succeed in climbing in Nepal. How many and times have you been to, not, go ahead and finish your thought, but then I'm wondering how many times did you spend, how long how many times have you been out in that area of the world uh, that area being asia well because i see that you have a first ascent of the kangsheng face is that correct yes and so you've been on everest yes and how 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 did, did you, was it a it was it doesn't seem like that was just a one a one-time oh, thing yeah right. you spent no, I, time there by by the late 70s, mm -hmm. I, I was uh, finishing up at university and, you know, I don't know why I had been drawn to mountains rather than, say, uh, rock climbing or specifically uh, waterfall climbing. Mm -hmm. uh, but mountains remained a kind of goal for me. I, I, that was a process of learning that attracted me. Uh, so to, to, to answer that, I would say by the, you know, by the end of the seventies, I was focused on where are the biggest challenges for mountains. Okay. I'd gone, you know, into the Canadian Rockies mm -hmm. um, and I had gone by that time to Yosemite um, my first experience in Asia was actually with an American Alpine Club exchange program with the Soviet Union in 1978. Wow. And, and we went out to Tajikistan and climbed in the Pamirs um, of Central Asia. Yeah. Uh, Pamirs being one of the five 
major ranges of Asia, along with the Tian Shan and the Kunlun and the Karakoram and the Himalaya. So we, for me, that was uh, my first ever, wasn't my first foreign trip, mm -hmm. but it was my first time to Asia. And I realized I wanted more. There was so many mountains in Asia, so many mountain ranges, each one of them as large as the Canadian Rockies. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I realized, you know, I only had one lifetime. So I better get busy if I wanted to, you know, get to know them all. Yeah. Um, over the next years, I tried very hard to find funding, which was the big challenge, and support to go to these, to these places. And for a long time, you know, that was almost impossible. Uh, you know, trying to, to approach a company and not, not even a climbing company, just any entity and say, hey, look, we'd like to do thus and such. Would you be willing to support us? You know, you could hear the door slam in your face. <laughs> so that became a kind of uh, concept. Mm -hmm. And um, I did what I could. The following year in 1979, I took a job uh, guiding a Himalayan peak called Annapurna 4, a 24,000 foot mountain in the Annapurna range. Uh, but it got me there. Yes. And, um, you know, I was willing to sell my soul, you know, to get a trip to go to Asia. And that, that was my first time to the Himalaya. So it, 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 in the next 25 years or so, um, I honed that enthusiasm and i went out there every year uh sometimes twice a year and and then i would also kind of mix that in with going down to south america where i could get guiding work um get my way paid and between you know clientele groups i could find time to climb so i began because i i spoke spanish from my studies in barcelona people were looking for trip leaders, as they were called, to take uh, adventure travel tours into the Andes. So I, I, I took advantage of that employment and, and ended up um, in South America a lot. But it, to answer your question, yeah, I've made, I don't know, about 30 trips to Asia uh, and at least as many to South America. Um, Did you, know, you learn Nepalese? What's that? Did you learn Nepalese? Well, you, I never learned to be fluent in the Nepali, but you certainly learn, you know, the numbers and you learn, you know, pidgin Nepali right. um, so that you can communicate. Yes. Uh, you know, I had friends who actually did learn Nepali and I, I was always very in high admiration of them. For me, where I, where I talk about language skills was yes. mostly relevant in South America, where where, um, of course, my Spanish from Spain, although I had a different accent, mm -hmm. uh, I was able to facilitate and organize a lot of things that I felt would have been done much more poorly had I not spoken the language. So that when I went into places uh, like the Waiwash or the Blanca or the Ausangate Massif, the Vilcanota, the Vilcabamba, and in places like Peru, um, you know, I could organize uh, horses and I could organize logistics uh, with, uh, with ease. Uh, that all I was trying to say was that rock climbing was a piece of, of mountaineering, but yeah. so was knowing, say, high altitude medicine. And, and, yeah. and there were, and I realized that there were people that spent their entire lives learning about high altitude medicine. And there were people that spent their entire lives learning about, for example, uh, how to predict weather. And there were people who spent their entire lives learning uh, photography. Well, photographers had an in on how to get on these expeditions. So there were a number of like careers that you could that you could follow that would give you a kind of uh, basis for which to to climb with and uh, whether that was photography or as a uh, a physician on mountaineering expeditions or as a lead alpinist who might be you know pushing the route upwards it was just one of the ways and and language skills 
was equally as important. So, you know, I'm just trying to say that the mountaineering had a lot of different pieces to it and any one of them could have been an entire career and how you learned and picked from those different careers, you know, classes in first aid and, and understanding uh, diet and trying to figure out, uh, you know, how to put together uh, a group of, um, of people that could work together efficiently mm -hmm. in, a, in a high pressure situation. That was a whole different skill that I, I had no idea about, but was really important when you tried to take a team to climb, say, the Kangsheng face of Everest. Absolutely. And, and I was a young kid. I was 27 years old when I went to Everest. It was my sixth uh, expedition to Asia at the time. And, and, and I was learning. But, you know, it takes about 10 trips to Asia before you start to really understand how it all works. And then, you know, over the next 20 years or trips, you begin to hone those skills um, to a degree that, you know, makes it, I don't want to say possible, but it begins to make more sense. And, uh, you know, a lot of people were getting killed and a lot of people were ending up in bad situations. Most of your trips were a failure and you had to learn that, you know, if, if one out of five of your trips was a, was a success, was that okay? You know, it's hard to go three or four years without a success in quotes and still manage to raise money yeah. uh, people tend to shy away from that kind of batting average but in himalayan climbing if you want to stay alive the batting average is relatively low absolutely uh, hitting a home run is pretty hard uh, i lucked out enormously with the east face of everest it was just unbelievable luck um but it was you know a kind of notch from which i could use as a calling card when i went forward after that saying i've got an idea would you be willing to sponsor us or help us with equipment or sleeping bags or or boots or sunglasses and 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 that you know you build slowly over many many years so that that's really the answer to your question was, you know, it's a very slow, long process because raising the money to go to Asia is so hard. It really makes you realize on a conceptual level how tiny we are, really, because I mean, you're talking about all of the effort that it takes to get to Asia 30 times, sometimes once a year, sometimes twice a year. Your average office worker, I think, is struggling just to get through any year one year <laughs> you know what i mean just well, you know yeah. and you're talking about like somebody might turn you down for funding because maybe you had one out of five trips become a success but the other four were potentially life or death situations and nobody wants to pay that bill and you don't want to have that to be resting on your mind or your conscious so um so that seems like a like a very high success rate from that perspective, for sure. When yeah, you're I mean, about life or death. I mean, it was always a, a dilemma because um, you know you, you were aware of the competition being intense for funding, yes. and 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 it's very easy to walk into a meeting with a grandiose plan. Um, it, it was a different thing to come home with that project successfully completed. And so by nature of the industry, remember this was all before the internet, mm -hmm. uh, you had to figure out what you could offer to these people to make their investment seem worthwhile. And it was a certain amount of, 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 of exploration in that way trying to understand what it was that they were after and to see if you could provide that for them. So for example, in the outdoor industry, it was very different from the financial world where we had to have money for actually to pay for airfares and hotels. Right. So 
could I go directly to an airline like Thai Airways and say, would you sponsor us with some free baggage? Right, Which right. is, you know, a different way to attack the financial problem. It was very different from that, uh, say, to going to Marmot or North Face and saying, would you give us, you know, some sleeping bags and some backpacks because we have to outfit, um, you know, Ali as an officer, a cook, uh, a team of six people or whatever. Uh, we need this, 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 and this. So, you, you, you know, you begin to try and figure out how can I give back to these people what they're what would make it worthwhile for them. The outdoor industry had a pretty clear, you know, sales mentality that we understood, right. which was, you know, selling more Gore-Tex or selling more uh, boots. Um, but the financial world, like, say, an airline or um you know, just imagine the kinds of people you might go to. A record label once yeah. gave us some money. Uh, you had to be very sensitive to how you could. I really, I, I like a return your, on investment was yeah, basically like your, the thought. Your, those are creative solutions, really, because um, you know maybe your average climber that's out there or budding alpinist doesn't realize that they, you know, go everywhere, ask your airline, ask your, you know, um, your pots and pan company, <laughs> you know, exactly. right. You know what I mean? You're exactly. Stuck. No, that's right. We and would look at exactly what we needed <laughs> and we would say, you know, if it's, if it's less than a certain amount of money, it's easier to raise the money. If it's yeah. like, for example, sunblock, um, there was only so much sunblock we could use on an expedition. Right. 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 So, Sunblock companies weren't probably a place for us to spend a lot of time. It'd be cheaper just to buy two hundred dollars worth of sunblock. Sure. But if it was something like, uh, you know, especially a company that could manufacture a number of different items, mm. uh, I had a very close working relationship with Cascade Designs in Seattle, for example, because they made so many wonderful products that we needed for for camping yes. and that wasn't just things like foam pads and, and therm arrests, but they had all sorts of things because they they manufactured uh, water purification devices they manufactured lanterns you know through their different you know branches like msr um and 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 this really helped us uh that that was the way you like kind of looked at the problem. But if it was just, for example, um, trying to raise money, maybe the easiest way was to organize a trek to base camp, uh, a fundraising trek where, you know, you, you could offer other things to people and, and include, say, a thousand dollar donation or contribution through a 501c3 to, um, you know, help fund your project in addition to the trekking cost. Nice. And, and, and you, you kind of became creative, you know, and, and tried to find ways to raise a couple of thousand here. And then, of course, every member was responsible for raising a certain amount of money as well, just as we all were on, on Everest. You know, Everest was a, 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 bit of a, a bit of a unicorn. You know, nobody could figure out how to raise that kind of money. Mm. except for people who were in a different league than us climbers. Uh, I'm talking about the, the, uh, the Jim Morrissey's of the world. Uh, you know, the people that, that really raised um, the money and made those kinds of, of funds possible. We were in the trenches uh, trying to raise five thousand ten thousand fifteen thousand dollars so that we could go on a twenty thousand dollar trip um and if each member you know of of a team of four could put in two thousand now you had eight and all you had to do was find another 12 you know that kind of thing yeah, that's awesome i love it how incredible and it's it's very fun i bet you have you look back on that very fondly as well because it probably really pulled your team together May I ask how long have you been with Loa Boots? And I love Loa Boots, by the way. <laughs> I cannot say enough good things about them. I mean, they're so comfortable from the moment you put them on. So cozy. I love them. How long have you been with Loa? About 10 years I've been working with Loa now. 
Wonderful. They are just fantastic. Um, you know, I can't imagine also like, I think one of the, because I think I started with rock climbing in those tiny little shoes. Now, I mean, I did grow up hiking. Okay. <laughs> so I was always, I mean, I have, uh, I have this in my head constantly because when I was growing up, my dad would always say, get your hiking boots. I mean, like every weekend, you know, and then I knew I was in trouble for hours. I was just going to be out. <laughs> You're in trouble. You know, right? you know, like you said, trying to keep up with the adults. Um, but you know, when rock climbing happened, um, tiny little shoes, you know, and it's all right. a rubber exterior and you have like, they, they're technologically built so that you can get your toe into that spot, you know, and then <laughs> I'm imagining climbing something with these boots on and uh, that is that steep and it's just incredible. Um, yeah. So, but go, go ahead and, you know, talk a little bit about your experience maybe with, with uh, working with Loa or their technology or maybe a fun trip that you had wearing the boots or something like that. I don't know. Well, you know, it's a, it's a great honor to work for a, a boot company that you respect as much as I respect Loa. Mm -hmm. They, they're a, a family run company in Germany. And uh, my introduction to Loa, of course, I knew them uh, early on. People had some of the original cold weather boots uh, were called Loa Triplex boots, which was um, a model back in the 70s that was leather and had not two, but three different uh, boots that you would slip on, a kind of inner boot that fit inside a middle boot that fit inside a, a leather shell. And um, we were, as everyone, you know, trying to figure out how to keep our feet warm in places like the Canadian Rockies in winter. Yes. And uh, it was a challenge. And boots were were uh, were uh, in an important part of that but my introduction to actually working with loa came um, years and years later through the american uh division of loa boots that's based in connecticut uh, i had become familiar with their manager uh, over the years and when he was looking for um, an ambassador uh, to, to help with the brand, uh, I suppose he thought of me and gave me a call and, and, and we began to work together. I, I didn't really know the brand and the history of the brand at the time. And of course, although I'd heard of the, 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 the name, uh, it wasn't until I began to get to know the people involved that I really gained the respect that I do have uh, today for the brand. I think standing out in my mind is is their loyalty to the outdoors. Uh, I, I really believe that um, a, a manufacturer of outdoor equipment can have a culture. And if that culture promotes uh, inclusivity and promotes enthusiasm about getting out and getting people out, uh, regardless of whether they sell them a pair of boots or not, uh, that really resonates. And I began to see that Loa had that sort of enthusiasm. I got it from not only the people that were working as other ambassadors, but it, it came down through the, the culture that was created in, in the headquarters. Uh, people who work there, they, they like spending time in the out of doors. They promoted uh, a feeling of, of, you know, any boot will get you outside. And, and that's a good thing. We make a good boot, but there are other good boots. And, and we don't care what boots you wear as long as you're outside. You know, we're not, we're not if Loa fits your foot, we're celebrating. We'd love to provide you with a pair of boots. But we're not there to to uh, force a pair of Loa boots down your throat, especially if you know you have a foot that doesn't fit our boot. Right. Uh, we try to make boots that fit 
a majority of people, but we certainly don't make boots that fit every foot. And, and uh, that kind of um, enthusiasm is a kind of genuine uh, enthusiasm that I, I, that resonated with me. And I picked up on that over the years, uh, not, not just from, uh, you know, again, the, the people who were designing boots, but from the ambassadors there. Um, sometimes uh, we managed to bring uh, ambassadors from Germany into uh, North America. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, there's just a very strong family feel to that company that, um, that I admire and I, and I feel honored to be a part of. Yeah. Well, my first boot was a Vasque Sundowner. Um, right. that, that I bought as an adult, you know what I mean? So when I went right. to my first like Knowles training and started doing all that stuff, I was in college, I think I was 19 or something like that. And so it was a vast sundowner and my, um, one of my professors, so I was part of this whole college thing that was going to go and do this big outside thing. And, um, he was one of the first, he was the first rock gym owner, uh, mm -hmm. in, the Chicagoland area. And anyway, he, so he said, well, you know, if you want to get a boot that you're going to last forever and ever and ever, you know, get, get this one. It's got this full leather body, blah, 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 blah. But you're going to have to break them in. <laughs> so, you know, there, we, there was probably 10 of us and we had our vast sundowners on and we we're standing in buckets of warm water <laughs> trying to just, you know, soften the leather to get it to form fit onto your foot, you know, um, I slipped these Loa boots on and I'm like in heaven instantly. I'm like, well, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure we didn't need to do that, but you know, in my mind, I'm like, wow, technology has really come a long way. <laughs> you well, know? no, I can't say that <laughs> it's not a good idea to break in your boots before, you know, you, you, you know, even Loa boots need a break in period. So yeah, yeah. you're very kind to say that. Sure. And I, you know, I agree that that uh you know i'm not putting if, if these we, in buckets of water though <laughs> i'm not going to be standing in buckets of water with these boots it's well you know bad. it's you know obviously when you slip your foot into a boot if, if it gives you that warm fuzzy feeling yeah. you know that's a real plus right it but is maybe it has more to do with whether we heat the boot up with a with a hair dryer before you slide your foot there you in go. There you, go. Then, you know or maybe we give you a dry pair of socks you know so <laughs> your foot feels really comfy but you're not feeling anything to do with the boot right. I, i'm laughing but you know yeah. you know it's like any kind of uh you know, it's like buying pillowcases, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you touch them and you, you know, you do the thread count and say, Ooh, that feels really nice. You know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh my but God. Does it no, last no. through, you know, 2,500, you know, laundering yeah. uh, cycles? I, you know, that's a different question. <laughs> it is for sure. Yeah. Well, and then also like talk about warm socks. I mean, so my, like I said, my dad was a Marine. So my wool socks, when I was growing up, I had nothing but wool socks that were probably like a half inch thick all around. I mean, talk about nerdy, right? I mean, like I didn't have enough troubles, you know, in my own self being, you know, in whatever grade I had these big, thick wool socks I had to wear all the time. Now we've got these lovely smart wool socks or merino wool, this and that, you know, I mean, so many different choices and they're fantastic. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You're right. What could be nicer? <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. I love gear. I love, I love gear. So yeah. But you know, it's a far cry from where you could pick up a pair of tube socks, you know, in a pack of 10 for yes. six dollars. And oh, now, you know, it tells you $16 or $26 to oh, get yes. a pair of merino wool socks. That's right. You're not joking around there. That is true. But I would rather have the merino wool socks, believe me. You know? <laughs> me too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, cotton socks, get those wet, forget it. They're never going to dry. So yeah, well, it's been a real pleasure talking to you, Carlos. I really, I really just, I appreciate you. And I, I'm looking very much forward to seeing you uh, at the Valdez. Well, feelings Center. mutual with the amount of work you're doing on this, uh, this, uh, you know, Valdez Adventure oh, Alliance. They, they're very lucky, I have to say. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I, I, I love them too. So yeah, no, they tell me, they tell me they love me. So it's always nice to hear.
Thanks for saying so. And thanks for joining me today. My pleasure. My pleasure. I look forward to meeting you in a few weeks. Great. Well, have a great rest of your day, Carlos. Okay, you too, Michelle. <laughs> bye. Thank bye, you. Bye. Take care. Thanks again for listening to Low Tech Tuesdays by Low Tech and Wild. The mission and vision of Valdez Adventure Alliance is based in nature therapy. The events and resources provided allow people to find the satisfaction of self-accomplishment through effort, of climbing, of riding bikes, of hiking, of trail building, of immersing in nature. Our objective is to be a resource for people to find deep happiness and healthy outlets for themselves. Thank you for those who sponsor Valdez Adventure Alliance. IMBA, the International Mountain Biking Association, Access Fund, the American Alpine Club. We'd also like to thank the City of Valdez, Alaska, the Fat Mermaid, Bike Flights, Camp, Alaska Pipeline, CVEA Community Foundation, Sterling, Loa Boots, Raven, Alaska, Athletic Brewing, Best Western, Valdez Avalanche Center, and The Prospector. Some 2021 event sponsors we'd like to shout out to also our Tiger Tail, Nick's Wax, and Mountain Equipment. Thank you for listening and have a great day.